Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ronald Coleman and Susan Hayward in The Petrified Forest with Lawrence Tierney. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Thomas Mitchell. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Top billing is the ambition of every actor. And we're fortunate in having on our stage tonight a man who holds the long-distance record as a top star in motion pictures. I'll not forget that my first appearance before the camera was with Ronald Coleman in Lost Horizon. Perhaps one reason for his long record would be that he selects his material with care. And that's why Ronnie is with us tonight in Robert Sherwood's exciting drama, The Petrified Forest. He appears with that talented young actress, Susan Hayward, as the man and woman whom fate dramatically brings together in one of the strangest love stories of our time. An outstanding Broadway stage success, The Petrified Forest takes place in the 1930s, when Americans still throng the highways, and the roadside tavern was the outpost of a restless nation, a meeting place for every type of traveler, from wealthy tourist to armed desperado. And the armed desperado in our cast is the new RKO actor, Lawrence Tierney, who has just finished playing the title role in the screening of the Dillinger. We bring you tonight's play on the birthday of the father of the English theater, William Shakespeare. Since Shakespeare's time, of course, the theater has grown immeasurably in scope and, I dare say, popularity. In fact, you could find no better example than this stage of ours, which raises its curtain every Monday night to an audience of many millions in return for their loyalty to Lux Flicks. And if your attendance is rewarded, and I hope it always will be, by the best in Hollywood stars and plays, I'm sure your loyalty to Lux Flakes is rewarded by longer life to precious fabrics and pleasanter, easier ways to care for them. Well, it's time for our curtain. And the first act of Petrified Forest, starring Ronald Coleman as Alan Squire and Susan Hayward as Gabby, with Lawrence Tierney as Duke Mantee. Crawling over a vast area in northeast Arizona, there's a huge forest of trees that have turned to stone, the petrified forest. And a dozen or so miles away, clumped on the edge of the desert, there's a tiny oasis in all this wasteland. It's called the Black Mesa Barbecue and Filling Station. Lonesome and weather-beaten, still it's a living to old Grandpa Maple and to the strangely attractive girl who stands behind the lunch counter. His granddaughter, Gabby. What's the matter? Don't you like the pie? Ah, it's lousy. Oh, yeah? You still got that engine cooking for you? Call is okay. So lay off or eat somewhere else. Christmas, <laughs> telling them, Gabby. Hey, Pop, who's the big football hero out there? That's Bose. Helps me with the gas. Where are you boys heading? Uh, straight down the road, stringing wires. You think your work's tough. In my day, you had to be tough. Paiutes, Apaches, and plenty of white men with no love for their neighbors. Yes, sir, it was killer be killed. <laughs> a boy, Mr. Maple. Tell him about the time you took a shot at Billy the Kid. I didn't take no shot at the kid. He took a shot at me. Two shots. You see, I was standing well, like Well, Papa's been very interesting, but we gotta be going. Now, what's the bad news, Gabby? Fifty-five cents apiece. Fifty-five cents apiece. Say, you are even money. Be seeing you, Mr. Maple. Call again, boys. Yes, yeah, so long. I always enjoy talking to anybody in the telegraphing business. You always enjoy talking. Where are you going, Gramp? I need some cool air. Going for your walk, Gramp? Yeah, Bose. Why don't you sit down a while and cheer up Debbie? Yeah, maybe I'll do that, yeah. I'm doing okay. Oh, you heard what your Grandpa said. What's bothering you, Gabby? Don't you like me? No, not a great deal. Ah, that's okay. Seeing as I've been here just a little while, I haven't had a chance to get into my act. Hey, what's that? It's a book, and you wouldn't like it. How do you know how I feel about things? Poems. You're reading poems. Oh, boy, get a load of this. The shapely, slender shoulders small, long arms, hands wrought in glorious wise. Oh, romantic, huh? <laughs> I suspected right along all you needed was a little encouragement. It's great poetry. I can think of a lot better ways to spend your time. Hey, Bose. Yeah? Why do you always wear that football jersey, number 42? Because I'm proud of it. That's why. Why shouldn't I wear it? 
Ah, oh, forget it. Well, I would have made All-American, that's all. Except I wasn't with the big team. You ought to see the newspaper clippings I got. What's an almost All-American doing here? Working a gas pump. Well, you can call me a sap if you want to, Gabby, but I guess I'm falling in love with you. Well, cool off, Bose. If Graham comes back and sees you trying to make a pass, you're going to be out of a job. Yeah, so what? Hey, baby, you didn't mean that about, well, about not liking me, did you? Okay. I like you. Enough for a kiss, maybe? Cut it out, Bose. I said cut it out! Good evening. Oh, oh, good evening, sir. What can we do for you? May I order something to eat? Sure. Miss Maple here will take care of you. Don't you want to sit down, sir? Thanks. Here's the menu. Driven for? Oh, I've been hitchhiking. Wonderful the progress you can make by wiggling your thumb. Now, the menu. Uh, it says, today's special, barbecue. What's the barbecue? Well, here it's a hamburger sandwich. It's always today's special. It's pretty good. Uh, I want it. And I'd like some soup and some beer, and I'll order the dessert later. Okay. Uh, another question. Where am I? This place is called Black Mesa, but there's nothing else here. Just bumming along? I'll oh, call it gypsying. I had a vague idea. I'd like to see the Pacific Ocean and perhaps drown in it, but that depends. Oh. You're English, aren't you? Oh, you might call me an American once removed. But if you don't mind... Okay, I'll uh, get the soup. Thanks. Good evening. Enjoying your dinner? Excellent. Want your coffee? Well, that charming young lady said she'd bring it right in. That's my granddaughter. Oh. I just been out for a walk. I met the sheriff. He gave me this. Newspaper? Yes, sir. Denver Post. And look, six killed in Oklahoma City Massacre. Duke Man T. Sought. And here's his picture. Duke Man T. Did he do that? Him and his friends. Ah, he doesn't look very vicious, does he? Well, you can't never tell a killer except by his chin. Now, that's a funny thing. Killer always holds his chin in. Ever hear of Billy the Kid? Oh, yes, indeed. I knowed him well. Took a couple of shots at me once. I congratulate you on still being with us. Well, it was kind of dark. Uh, he'd had a few drinks. <laughs> Just wanted to scare the pants off of me. Here's your coffee. Thanks. Just set it down, Gabby. Oh, you know, you can go just so long without food. That's right. Been having some bad luck? Yep. Uh, no disgrace these days. Uh, what line uh, work you in, mister? No, none just now. At times, I've been a writer. Writer, huh? What's your name? Alan Squire. Squire. No, can't say I ever heard of you. Well, it says your supper's ready, Graham. I like, like eating in the kitchen, Mr. Squire. Uh, in there, I can see what I'm getting. Uh, pleased to have met you. Oh, pleased to have met you, sir. That's a charming old gentleman, your grandfather. Yes. He told me he'd been missed by Billy the Kid. <laughs> Poor Grampy tells everybody that. You get pretty sick of him after a while. I met a writer once. Oh? Yeah, he was on his way to the coast. Said I ought to go to Hollywood and look him up. I'm not that dumb. They never mean it. You want to go into the movies? There's nothing I want. Except to go to Bourges. To where? Bourges. That's in France. Oh. You'd never guess it, but that's where I came from. Are you French? Partly. I was born in Bourges. But all I know about it is from the postcards my mother sends me. They've got a cathedral there. Is your mother in Bourges? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dad brought us back here in 1919 after the war. She stuck it out here in this desert for a couple of years, and then she packed up and went back. Some people said it was cruel of her to leave me, but... Well, what could she do? She just couldn't live here, and you can't blame her for that. She tried lots of times to get me over there to see her, but while my father was alive, he wouldn't allow it. And now? Well, not so long ago, she got married again to a Frenchman with a bookstore and three kids. I thought maybe it wouldn't be right barging in on her now, but I'd sure like to see her. Do you speak French? Only what you can learn in high school. Mm -hmm. Every birthday, my mother used to send me a book, but they were all in French. So last year, I, I asked her if she'd mind sending me one in English. It's this book here, The Poems of Francois Villon. Ever read it? Oh, yes. Oh, that's wonderful poetry. My mother wrote something on the cover. A ma chère petite Gabrielle. That means, to my dear little Gabrielle. She gave me that name. Gabrielle. Huh? It's a beautiful name. Wouldn't you know it'd get changed into Gabby by these no-good desert rats? <laughs> you, you share your mother's opinion of the desert. Huh? Yes. But you find solace in the poems of Francois Villon. Well, they get the smell of the gasoline and hamburger out of my system. <laughs> would, you, would you like to read me one of those poems, Gabrielle? You mean now? Yes. 
while I'm finishing today's special. Hmm? Okay. I'll read you the one I like best. He wrote this about a friend of his who was getting married. At daybreak, when the falcon claps his wings, no wit for grief, but noble heart held high, with loud, glad noise he stirs himself and springs and takes his meat and towards his lure draws nigh. Did you ever see a falcon? Oh, uh, yes. What does it look like? Oh, not very pleasant, like a hawk. And in a way, it's like this man here. His picture's in the newspaper, Duke Mantee. Oh, there were some Mexicans in the kitchen a while ago. They told Paula that Mantee's heading this way. Won't you finish the poem? Oh, sure. Such good I wish you, yea and heartily. I'm fired with hope of true love's need to get. Knowing love writes it in his book. For why? This is the end for which we twain are met. You know, that's wonderful stuff. Uh -huh. Wonderful. But that's the way the French people are. They can understand everything, like, like life and love and death. And they can enjoy it or laugh at it, depending on how they feel. And that's why you want to go to France? For understanding? I will go there. Where there's something beautiful to look at, and wine, and dancing in the streets, and mm. happiness. If I were you, I'd stay here, Gabrielle, and avoid disappointment. I've been to France. Writing books? No. No, planning to write books. You see, I, I married. My wife supported me. Oh? Oh, please don't think too badly of me. I once actually wrote a book. I was 22 when I wrote it. It was very, very stark. It sold slightly over 600 copies. It cost the publisher quite a lot of money. And it also cost him his wife. You see, she divorced him and married me. She saw in me a major artist who needed only a background to bring him out. She gave it to me with a fine view of the Mediterranean. Well, for eight years, I reclined on my background, waiting for the major artist to step forth and write. But he didn't. And you've left your wife now? Yes. I'm glad you did. Well, it was her own suggestion. She'd taken up with a Brazilian painter, also a major artist. So I decided to go forth and discover America. What were you looking for? Well, that's rather hard to say. Oh, something to believe in, I suppose. Something worth living for. Something worth dying for. And what have you found? <laughs> ah, nothing so interesting as an old man who was missed by Billy the Kid. And a fair young lady who reads the young. Well, I do other things that might surprise you. Oh, I'm sure you do. I wouldn't tell this to everybody, but I paint pictures. Are they any good? Of course not. Could I see them? Oh, I never let anybody see them. I'd only get kidded. They're kind of crazy. Oh, please let me see them. Perhaps it's my mission to introduce you to posterity as an American genius. Are you kidding me? No, 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 Gabrielle, I... No, I've never kidded anybody outside of myself. Okay, but you've got to promise not to tell anybody. All right, my word of honor, for all it's worth. I'll go get them. And these others here are all desert scenes. Oh, yeah. This one's a portrait. Oh? It's Paula, our Indian cook. <laughs> not much of a likeness. Oh, no, no, I'm sure you didn't intend it to be... Tell me, what, what made you paint in this strange manner? It's, it's just the way I feel. You won't hurt my feelings if you say they're no good. Oh, no, no, I, I'm tremendously impressed. And also bewildered. I bet I could improve if I could get to France. They've got the finest art schools in the world there. There's beautiful things to paint. Well, don't you, don't you realize there are probably thousands of artists in France today who are saying, I'd find a really big theme for my canvas if I could only get to Arizona. Yes, I know. They say the desert's full of mystery and it's haunted and, well, all that. Maybe it is. But there's something in me that makes me want something different. Well, I know there's something in you. I wish I could figure out what it is. Listen, you've been to France. What are they like there? Frenchmen are not like they once were. Well, no one in Europe is. I've always imagined that Frenchmen must all be like Dion. Gay and reckless, poetic. No, no, especially not reckless. But they're always having a good time, aren't they? Not invariably. Would you like to marry a Frenchman? I don't want to marry anybody. I want to be free, always. Well, how about uh, number 42? You know, the stalwart youth in the football jersey. When I first came in, he, he was... Bose, yeah. He was trying to kiss me. He's after me, all right. Do you think he'll succeed? I haven't decided yet. 
What do you say? No, 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 don't, no, don't ask me, Gabrielle. No, let your French blood guide you. <laughs> In matters like that, it's infallible. But you ought to know something. You've seen a lot. I don't know anything. How can you say that? You've got a lot of brains. Yep, brains without purpose. Noise without sound. <laughs> Shape without substance. I belong to a vanishing race. I'm one of the intellectuals who thought they'd conquered nature. But the world's in a chaos, and what's the reason? Who knows? I do. I'm probably the only living person who does know. It's nature hitting back. Oh, not with the old weapons of floods and plagues, but fighting back with strange new weapons called neuroses. She's deliberately inflicting mankind with the jitters. Nature's annoyed. She's taking the world away from the intellectuals and giving it back to the apes. She's... She... Forgive me, Gabrielle, and don't listen to me. For all I know, you may be an entirely different species. One of nature's own children. And therefore, able to understand her and laugh at her or enjoy her, depending upon how you feel. And, uh, by the way, the beer is excellent. It's made in Phoenix. And you talk like a fool. <laughs> no wonder your wife kicked you out. And no wonder she fell for you in the first place. That sounds alarmingly like a compliment. It is a compliment. What did you say your first name is? Alan. Alan Squire. I've been calling you Gabrielle, so you'd better... Where are you going from here, Alan? Well, that depends on where the road leads. It leads to the petrified forest. What's that? A gloomy place, full of dead trees that have turned to stone in the desert. The petrified forest. Mm, Suitable haven for me. Perhaps that's what I'm destined for. To make an interesting fossil for future study. Alan Squire, a specimen of the in-between age, who was born too late for the Great War and too soon for the one that's coming. Ah, I see you've taken my advice. You're not listening. I was just thinking. I'd like to go to France with you. You? Oh, no. no. I, I'm afraid I, I could never retrace my steps. You mean you haven't enough money? Even that is an understatement. Well, I haven't got enough either yet. But I've got a lot coming to me someday. Are you are you proposing to me? Trying to turn me into a gigolo again? No, it'll be different this time. Do you know how much Gramps got salted away in the bank at Santa Fe? Oh. $22,000. He won't give me any of it now, but it's all willed to me. We might have to wait years for it. But if you'd only stay. You think you'd like me as a life companion? I know I would. And I don't make mistakes. Wouldn't you like to be loved by me? Yes. Yes, Gabrielle. I should like to be loved by you. You think I'm attractive? Ah, there are better words than that for what you are. Then say you'll stay, Alan. I could have bows fired, and you haven't got anything else to do. That's just it. You couldn't live very long with a man who had nothing to do but worship you. That's a dull kind of love, Gabrielle. It's the kind that makes people old too soon. I thank you for the suggestion. You'll give me something wonderful to think about during my lonely wanderings. I'll think of the chimes of Bourges. And you. And the forest turned to stone. You mean you're going now? Yes. Well, I can't stop you. No, Gabrielle, you can't. But you can do me one great favor before I go. Would you mind very much if I kissed you goodbye? No, I wouldn't mind. You understand that it would be nothing more. I'd understand it. It'd be just a kiss. That's all. That's absolutely all. Gabrielle, I... So, so that's what's going on. Naked, huh? Who do you think you are? He didn't get fresh. He didn't get fresh. He only wanted to kiss me goodbye. Yes, the impulse is rather hard to explain. Pay your check and get out. How much do I owe, Miss Maple? Thirty cents. Thirty cents? Is that only eight thirty cents? Well, that brings me to another embarrassment. I, I haven't got thirty cents. Well, that's just fine, isn't it? That's just great. What do you got in your pack there? A shirt, socks, a passport, insurance policy, and a copy of *The Modern Man in Search of a Soul*. And you thought you could pay with a kiss, did you, Royal? Take your hands off him, Bo. I beg your pardon. <clears throat> yes, sir. We'd like some gas and oil, please. Uh. Get going, Bo. How many gallons? Or whatever it needs. Henry, ask the hotel. Yes, dear. Any idea how far we are from the Phoenix Biltmore? A good 200 miles. A good 200 miles. Hmm, that's just fine. Give the man his gasoline, Bo. Okay, okay. Take a rest, Henry. You forgot some of the last thing. Yes, dear. I know, dear. Cigarettes. Well, Miss Maple, goodbye. Alan, wait a minute. Oh, mister, 
Say, if you're going to Phoenix, maybe you'd have room for my friend. Oh? Mr. Squire. He's on his way to the coast and... Well, he hasn't got a car right now. He's an author. But really, I... I guess you're a little want... suspicious, what with Duke Mantee on the loose and all that. Well, well, I guess it would be all right. Thank you. And thank you, Miss Maple. I'll remember your kindness. Oh, I forgot to give you your change. Here you are. A dollar? But I... Oh, but I wanted you to keep that. Take it, please. <laughs> I can't very well pretend. When you I get to the Pacific need... Ocean, send me some pictures, will you? I like pictures of water. Henry! Yes, dear. Here you are, miss. Come along, Mr. Squire. I suppose I'll never see you again, Gabrielle. Well, that's the way it is in a gas station. They come and they go. Now, somehow or other, I'll repay that dollar. Heaven knows when. Maybe we'll run into each other someday in Bourges. Yes, yes. Good, goodbye, Gabrielle. Goodbye, Alan. Mind if I sit down a while, Gabby? Sit down, Bruce. Uh, there hasn't been a car pass since that guy with the package. I wonder how come he gave that panhandler a lift. He wasn't a panhandler. Hey, you sound like you were nuts about him. Do I? Well, I'm not. I, um, how about being a little nice to me for a change? Oh, gee, Booz, I'd like to be nice to you. I'd like to be nice to everybody. Well, you can be, Gabby. How about you and me taking a walk around the mesa? You know what I've been doing? I've been sitting here thinking what he said. What did he say? He said that what's wrong with the world is that we've been trying to fight nature. He said we've got to admit that nature can't be beaten. Well, isn't that exactly what I've been trying to tell you all along? You and me, a night like this. <laughs> we could really get acquainted, baby. Sorry. I'm not in the mood. Now, how can you say that? Okay, folks, now just behave yourself and nobody will get hurt. Hey, what's the idea? Put down that gun. Who's the boss here? My grandfather. He's inside. What do you want? Trouble, Jackie? No trouble, boss. Another one? Yes. This is Duke Mantee, folks. He's the world-famous killer, and he's hungry. Now, get this. I and my friends are taking over here for a while. You dirty rat! Shut up, Bose. Tell Ruby and Bugs to come on in. Okay, Duke. Now, as for you two and whoever else might be here, I don't know how long we're going to be staying. But I'd like things to be nice and peaceful, see? We'll all have a few beers together, listen to the radio, and not make any wrong moves. Because I may as well tell you old Jackie there with the machine gun is pretty nervous and jumpy. And he's got the itch between the fingers. Okay? Now, suppose I take a little look around. <laughs> Thomas Mitchell and our stars Ronald Coleman and Susan Hayward will be back with Act Two of The Petrified Forest after intermission time. Here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins, doing sums on a timetable. Miami, Washington, New York, Boston, Chicago, St. Louis. Going somewhere, Libby? Oh, not me. This trip is on a very important war job. Who is making it then? A very attractive young lady. She's Miss Jenny Earl Cox, a Stevens College senior who has chosen this year's Maid of Cotton in a Southwide contest. And how does her trip help the war effort? Oh, she's selling war bonds. About a quarter of a million dollars worth already. She's also showing women in 35 leading cities how precious today's cottons are and how they can keep them lovely longer. That's important these days because the Army needs so much cotton, too. Tell us more about the Maid of Cotton, Libby. Oh, she's Mississippi-born, and so are all her family back to her great-great-grandfather who raised the first bale of cotton in Lowndes County. She ought to be a good ambassador for King Cotton. Mm-hmm. She has wavy brown hair... Sparkling blue eyes, a size 12 figure that shows her all cotton wardrobe to the very best advantage. Is everything she wears made of cotton? Mm-hmm, even her stockings and undies. Her wardrobe includes everything from a two-piece decay bathing suit to a floating organdy evening gown. They're all styles any woman can duplicate because they're made from easy-to-follow McCall patterns. All the fabrics are luxe tested too, so you know they'll stay color fresh time after time when you wash them with lukewarm water and mild luxe flakes. Yes, tests show colors stay lovely up to three times longer with gentle luxe care. Strong soap, hot water, and rough handling fade colors too soon. Make them look drab. Today's cottons are smart for any time of day or night. So give them the gentle care they deserve. Watch your local newspaper to see when the maid of cotton will model them in your city. We take you back to Thomas Mitchell and our stars. Act Two of The Petrified Forest, starring Ronald Coleman as Alan Squire and Susan Hayward as Gabby, with Lawrence Tierney as Duke Mantee. Only a 
few moments have passed since the descent of the killer, Duke Fanti, on the Black Mesa barbecue. While Bo stares helplessly into the muzzle of a submachine gun, Manti calmly surveys the lunchroom. Finally, he turns to the girl, called Gabby. All right now, sister, where's the old man? Your grandfather. Probably in his room. He takes a nap after supper. Get him, Jackie. Bug? Yeah? Park the packet in the shadows and stay in it. Keep your eyes open. Tell Jackie to bring me up here. How long are we staying here, Duke? Until the others get here. You're going to wait for that blonde? We told her we'd be here, didn't we? Now shut up. Okay, sister, we'd like something to eat. The cook's gone home. I'll have to go into the kitchen. Uh, Ruby Hill will go with you. He starts getting fresh, Gabby. You Relax, just... football. Hey, you better not let me get close enough to take a shock at you. Hey, I used to be quite a gridiron fan. What's your school? Nevada M&T. Hmm. Boy Scouts. That's the old man, Duke. He said you were Duke Man T. He said, you are Duke Man T the killer. Yeah, sit down, Pop. Hear what happened in Oklahoma City, Pop? It's all in the Denver Post. A regular massacre. How you doing, sister? The hamburgers will take a while. Well, then bring us some beer. You fellas like to join us? I never touch alcohol. I guess I'll have whiskey. And I'm not scared of you, Duke. I've known real killers in my Duke. time. Yeah? Watch it. you got a visitor. Okay. Get behind the counter, Jackie. Stay in the kitchen, Ruby. Gabrielle. Who is it? Gabriel. Alan. We were just held up about a mile down the road. Bandits, and they're around here somewhere. Yeah, so we heard. They took Mr. Chisholm's car. Yeah, and, and they drove and I... back here. Uh, oh, so we we meet again. He's Duke Man T, Mr. Squire. We were looking at his picture, remember? Join us in a little drink? Why, why, thank you. Yes. Uh, look at that chin. He's a killer, all right. He's a gangster and a rat. He ain't a gangster. He's a real old-time desperado. And if the sheriff finds out, we'll see some real killing, won't we? Let there be killing. All evening long, I've had a feeling of destiny closing in. You believe in astrology, Duke? I couldn't say, pal. Well, I don't normally, but as I was walking along that road, I looked up at the sky, and the stars seemed to be mocking me. They were pointing the way here and seemed to say, there's the end of your tether, you thought you could escape it and skip off to the Phoenix Biltmore, but we know better. Alan. I'm telling you what the stars told me. That perhaps they know that carnage is imminent and that I'm due to be among the fallen. That's a fascinating thought. Yeah, let's skip it. We are. Thanks. Thanks, sister. Well, here's happy days, folks. Yes, sir. It sure is pleasant to have a killer around here again. Yep. Pleasant to be back again among the living. Well, happy days. <laughs> Duke, it's away after ten. We've been here an hour and a half. So what? Jackie's right, Duke. I'm waiting here for Doris. I'm waiting here for Doris and the boys. But if she was going to show up, she'd have been I here I said now. I'm waiting here. Listen to them. I get among themselves. A bunch of yellow dogs. I'd be a little tactful, Bo. They're your guests. Hey, sister. What? I thought I told you to turn on the radio. It's time for the news. I did turn well, it turn off. Well, turn it up. Why don't you want me to hear? Okay, I'll turn it up. It's the greatest manhunt in the history of the Southwest. That's us, Dokey. Take a bow. The Mantee gang made its escape from Oklahoma City in two cars. One of which contained Manti and three men, and the other containing two men and one woman. The Manti car was seen today at Hillsboro in New Mexico, nearing the Arizona border. The others were identified when they held up the police station at Elderton and fled with a large supply of guns and ammunition. Nice going, boys. Both cars are undoubtedly headed for the border. State troopers, sheriffs, and deputies have every highway covered, and their orders are shoot first and ask questions later. I'll now give you the scores of the Turn it off, Jackie boy. Carnegie, Ruby, tell Bugs to bring in that sack of ammunition and the road maps. You stay in the car. Okay. You want to make a run for the border? Oh, sure. We'll give you our whole route so you can tell them hick cops to give us a motorcycle escort. I think I'm about ready for another whiskey, Gabrielle, if I may. Listen, Panhander, who told you you could keep calling her by her first name? Hi, everybody. Here's the show, boss, of the map. Hey, when are we lambing out? When it's time. Sure. Just as soon as the Duke connects with that heavy data here. Well, I think we ought to get out of here. Here's a drink, Alan. Hey, wait a minute. How's he going to pay for all that liquor? That's two drinks he's had. I can pay, Bose. I have a dollar. A, a dollar? So, you were holding out on it, no, would you? No, 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 no. I've acquired it since then. Where'd you get it? Keep quiet. Probably those rich people in the car. But you must know, Bose. Gabrielle gave it to me. G Gabby! None of your business what I do. Duke! What? You fellas gonna spend the night here? Can't say, Pop. Maybe we'll decide to get buried here. Ah, you better come with me, Duke. I'm planning to be buried in the petrified forest. It's a graveyard of civilization. Dead stumps in the desert. That's where I belong, and so do you. Maybe you're right, pal. Uh, I'm eternally right. But what use do I make of it? Hey, about that dollar, Gabby. I said it was none of your business. Uh, you're crazy about him, aren't you? All right, what if I am? What did you say? I said I'm crazy about you. Oh, I swear I wasn't trying to be seductive, Bose. You... Alan. 
Alan, after you left here, I, I feel as if I'd come out of a dream. But I caught on to myself fast. I know I'll never be anything but another desert rat. France, art, dancing in the streets. That's all a lot of hooey. Remember what I asked you about going to France? Of course. But you wouldn't have done it, even if we had the money. No. You see, he doesn't give a hoot about me. I saw that plain enough. And it's only made me love him more. Gabby! I'm sorry I came back. When I left before, it was the poignant ending to, to an idyllic interlude. But now it's spoiled. You're sorry you heard the truth. <laughs> I'm the type of person to whom the truth is often distasteful. Uh, Graham, sit down, pal. I want to talk to Graham. Well, you can talk sitting down. I heard you doing it. All right. Mr. Maple, that money of yours buried in Santa Fe. How do you know about it? Now, what are you going to do with it? Leave it just where it is. And meanwhile, your granddaughter suffocates in this desert when a few of your thousands would give her the chance to claim her birthright. Ah, you, you were once a pioneer. What are you now? A mean old miser hanging on to money as though it meant something. Why don't you die and do the world some good? That's about the dirtiest crack I ever heard. What do you mean, talking to the old man like that? Joke. There's a man and a dame coming down the road. Looks like the owner of the pack will be borrowed. Okay, keep quiet when they get here. Okay, moon's bright. It's be real good out here. Uh, Duke, I was guilty of very bad taste, and I apologize to Mr. Maple. Sure. Yeah, you better crawl, or I might have to put the slug on you. Talking to an old man like that. Where are you going, Duke? Just to the window. Those people are coming. Get in the kitchen with Bugs. Sure. Listen, you. If you had any of Robin Hood in you, you'd go to Santa Fe and rob that bank and give it to her all before right, she... All right, Duke. Put him up. Put up your hands. Hey, what are you trying uh, to... Ah, Jackie left his gun, didn't he? Oh, I've been waiting for this chance all night. I've been watching every move you've been making. I've been... Who? <laughs> Jackie, Bugs. Yeah, Bones. Bones, you got hurt? Get that Tommy, Jackie. See what happens when you're careless? He's getting up, Duke. Oh. He got me in the hand. Just what is the meaning Get of... Get up, you. Frisk him, Bugs. Okay. I don't have that man pawing me again. I still can't figure what happened, Duke. Uh, that football hero almost had me. The society dame screamed. He turned his and head. I and... had the chance that I muffed it. I could have got man T, and she ruined everything. Henry, Henry, we're getting out of You're here. You're sitting down like everybody else. Suppose it's hurt. Take him in the kitchen, sister. You and Jackie. Better tie him up in there, Jackie, after she fixes his war wound. Come on, hero. Did you mean to hit him in the hand, Duke, or was it a bad shot? Bad shot, Pop. Uh. I had to get it off too fast. Mm. Now listen, all of you. I let that mug make a mug out of me, but don't anybody try it again. Anybody makes a wrong move, I'm going to kill a whole lot of you. Are you Manti? Yes, pal. Oh. Hey, Duke, um, would you mind passing me my knapsack? It's on the counter. What do you want with it? My life insurance policy. Uh, you'll find it there in a bundle of papers. Expecting to die, Mr. Squire? You've guessed it, Mr. Maple. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, my fountain pen? Go ahead. What about my car, Manti? Swell buzz. You intend restoring it to me and my luggage? Oh, you may get it back. Let's hope it isn't full of bullet holes and blood. Oh, I uh, took some jewelry out of the lady's bag. <gasps> You're nothing but a filthy thief. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Duke, I have a great favor to ask of you. Yeah? I don't think you'll refuse it because you're a man of great imagination. What are you getting at? Uh, this insurance policy is my only asset. Now, it's for $5,000. It was made out to my wife, but she's a rich woman and not a bad sort, really. She won't mind. You've been writing on it. Yes. I've changed the beneficiary. I've written on the policy that I want Miss Maple to receive the money. And if Mr. and Mrs. Chisholm here will witness my signature, I'm sure everything will be all right. Well, what I'm getting at is this, Duke. Uh, after they've signed it, I wish... I'd be much obliged if you'd just kill me. He's drunk. Now, let the man finish, Pop. No, it couldn't make any difference to you, Duke. They can only hang you once. And you, you can't be bothered by any humane considerations. You'd have a hard time finding a more suitable candidate for extermination. I'll be mourned by no one. You see, Duke, in killing me, you'd only be executing the sentence of the law. I mean, natural law. The survival of the fittest. Come on, stop showing off. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to outdo bows in gallantry. Well, is there anything unnatural in that? Can't you see I mean it? I've never heard of such a thing. Oh, probably not. But this is a weird country we're in, Mr. Chisholm. These mesas are enchanted. You have to be prepared here for the improbable. I'm only asking that you attest my signature on this paper. I believe you do mean it. Good for you, Mrs. Chisholm. You're a kindred spirit. Why, you're in love with that girl inside, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I suppose I am. And not unreasonably. She, she has heroic stuff in her. Why, she, she may be another Joan of Arc or Madame Curie. I want to show her that I believe in her, and how else can I do it? Living, I'm worth nothing to her. Dead, I can buy her the tallest cathedrals and golden vineyards and dancing in the streets. 
Now, one, one well-directed bullet will accomplish all that. Will you do it, Duke? I'll be glad to, pal. Then, then now, can I have this signed? Sure. Is he by chance insane? Don't ask me. He's no friend of mine. Of course he's insane, but what of it? Sign it, Henry. But you simply cannot trifle with insurance institutions like I this. I said sign it. Oh, give me the pen. There. That's better. Now I'll sign it. Ah. Thanks. Now, Mr. Maple, I'll entrust this policy to you. After I, uh, after the Duke has obliged, will you give it to some good lawyer for collection? My passport's in the knapsack for identification. Here you are. Thank you. Let me know when you want to be killed, pal. Oh, pick your own moment, Duke. Say, just before you leave, huh? But, um, I prefer to have her think you did it in cold blood. Will you all please remember that? And now... I think we'd all like to have a drink. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thomas Mitchell and our stars Ronald Coleman and Susan Hayward will be back with Act Three of The Petrified Forest in a moment. When Nancy and Jane's husbands went overseas, the girls decided to share an apartment. And the first night... I'll put the chops on. You set the table, okay? Sure. Mm, let's see. Where do we put the dessert plates? I got a cake. Oh, I don't think they're unpacked yet. But we can put the cake on the bread and butter plates after we've finished with them. Then we won't have so many dishes to wash. Oh, Nan, let's not start doing things like that. Let's use all our nice things, just as if the boys were here. Well, but Bob and I always did things like that. And put the salad on the dinner plates, too. No sense using a lot of extra dishes. Boy, you must be allergic to dishwashing. Well, I am. Just look at my hands. Well, you poor kid, they are red. But look, if you're doing the cooking, I ought to wash the dishes. And I don't mind how many there are. So Janie set the table her way. And afterwards, when she went to wash the dishes... Say, Nan, where's the soap? In the cabinet. Good grief, you didn't get this strong stuff for dishes, did you? Well, I always... Well, did. no wonder your hands are red. Wait a sec. What are you doing? Getting some Lux. Here, I had this box in the bathroom. Do you use Lux for dishes? Sure, I don't want to get dishpan hands. That strong stuff stings. Oh, I wondered how you kept your hands so nice. Well, just change from strong soap to gentle Lux flakes, honey, and yours will soon be nice again, too. But our budget... Lux won't even make a dent in it. A big box like this lasts simply ages. It's really thrifty. Yes, scientific tests prove that ounce for ounce, Lux Flakes wash up to twice as many dishes as other well-known dishwashing soaps. Hands stay lovely, too. Use Lux for your dishes today. Here's Thomas Mitchell with our stars. After the play, we'll meet our stars in person as they take their curtain calls. Now here's Act Three of The Petrified Forest, starring Ronald Coleman as Alan Squire and Susan Hayward as Gabby, with Lawrence Tierney as Duke Mantee. It's a half hour later. In the heavy purple shadows outside the Black Mesa barbecue, the gunman Ruby sits with his eyes on the black ribbon of road. Inside, Duke Mantee stares at the clock, and the lines of his face grow harder. Huddled at the counter are Alan Squire, Gramp, and the Chisholms. You'll keep the insurance policy, Mr. Maple, and you'll say nothing to Gabrielle. Sure. I'll keep it. What I've done. You think it's all legal, don't you? Well, it seems so to me. And I'd like to tell you just one thing, my friend. There ain't a woman alive that's worth $5,000. And let me tell you one thing, my friend. You're a forgetful old fool. Any woman is worth everything that any man has to give. Anguish, ecstasy, faith, jealousy, love, hatred, life or death. Don't you see? That's the whole excuse for our existence. It's what makes the whole thing possible and tolerable. <laughs> when you've reached my age, Grandpa, you'll have better sense. Henry, did you hear that? I heard. Now, that lovely, 
That lovely girl inside there, do you know what she is? No, you haven't the remotest idea. What is she? She's the future. She's the renewal of vitality and courage and hope. All the strength that's gone out of you. Oh, I can't say what she is, but, but she's essential to me and to the whole country and the whole miserable world. And please, Mrs. Chisholm, don't look at me like that. I know how I sound. I wonder if you really believe all that. I mean about women. Of course I do. And there by the window is a man who agrees with me. Don't you, Duke? I don't know, pal. I wasn't listening. Well, then let me speak for you. Mrs. Chisholm, Duke Manti could have been over the border long ago and safe. But he prefers to stay here and risk his life. And do you know why? Why? Because he has a rendezvous with a girl. Now, isn't that true, Duke? Yes, pal. That's it. Do you mean to say you... You ever have time for romance? Mm, not much, lady. Only like the Knights of the Round Table, between dragons. Yeah, I guess we're all a lot of saps. I wouldn't be surprised if I was a champ. You think I was kidding when I said I'd be glad to knock you off? Oh, I hope that neither of us was kidding. You think I was? I just wanted to make sure. You're all right, pal. You got good ideas. I'll try to fix it so that it won't hurt. Uh, you're all right, too, Duke. I'd like to meet you again someday. Maybe it'll be soon. You know, this frightful place has suddenly become quite cozy. Ah, that's... <laughs> Ah, that's my doing, Mrs. Chisholm. You can thank me for having taken it out of the realm of reality. I'm going to see something at last beside cliff dwellings. Henry, do you realize we're going to be witnesses of the murder? Well, he's actually going to shoot him. Oh, please, please, she, she's coming. How's those, Gabrielle? He'll be all right. Did you tie him up, Jackie? Yeah, in the bathroom. Duke, we got to get out of here. Yeah, I know. Something's happened to Doris. Something must have happened. Well, we'll give him a few minutes more. A few minutes more. Listen, Graham... I've got an idea we ought to sell out right away. Tomorrow. It's the best break we'll ever have. This place is going to be advertised all over the country. People are going to be flocking here just to see where Duke Mantee stops. Still aiming to take that trip to France? No. No, Gramp, I'll never get there. And I never knew it better than I do right now. Well, you want to be a great painter, don't you? You and your advice and your talk about nature. I thought you told me never to listen to you. Well, I did, but... Well, that's all the advice I'm going to take. Do you mind if I say something, my dear? Perhaps I could tell what you What do you things... know about me? Uh, nothing. Uh, and if I were you, Edith, I'd keep on... Henry, you. you'd never have the remotest conception what's inside me, and you never will have. You're a stuffed shirt with buttons made out of 18-carat diamonds. And I'm just as bad because I take my revenge out on you by nagging. All my life I've done what people have wanted me to do. First my parents, then my friends, and now you. And I hate my life. Dear Lord. Miss Maple, profit. Profit by my example. Perhaps you have something important to give the world. Don't you let them stifle you with their talk about duty. Go to France and find yourself. Suppose she learns there's nothing more to find. Even that would be better than endless doubt, believe me. You know... It's the strangest thing about this place. There's something about this lunch counter that brings out the autobiographical impulse. Now, Duke, Duke, what kind of a life have you had? Lousy, pal. I don't believe it. At least you're a real man, though an evil one. Uh, a real man, huh? What's it got me? I've spent most of my life since I grew up in jail. It looks like I'll spend the rest of my life dead. But where's the percentage? Well, thanks all the same, lady. I'll send you a postcard from Mexico. Excuse me, Duke, but how's the time getting along? It's just about up, pal. Oh, then I must talk to you, Gabrielle. You can wait till they're gone. No, no, I can't wait. I mean, when they go, I go. I have to tell you now that I love you. Now, listen, Alan, I don't want you to think... I tell you solemnly that I love you with all the heart that is left in me. Duke, are we waiting here just to listen to this? Shut up. He does love you, Miss Maple. He told us so. Now, no, please, Mrs. Chisholm, I'm capable of saying it. Don't make a fool of yourself, Alan. They're all staring at you. Yes, I know they are, but you've got to believe it. And you've got to remember it, because, you see, it's my only chance of survival. I told you about that major artist that's been hidden. Well, I'm transferring him to you. You'll find a line in that verse of Dion's that fits that. Something about, thus in your field, my seed of harvestry will thrive. You still think I was being comic? No, Alan. No, I just think that you're kind of crazy. Huh? And I guess so am I. And that's why I think we'd be terribly happy together. Oh, don't say that, Gabrielle. Why not? Well, I believe it with all my heart. Oh, maybe you're right. You're beginning to admit it. Oh, maybe we'll be happy together in a funny sort of way. Alan, if you're going away, I'm going with you. Wherever it is. No, Gabrielle, I'm not going away. Anywhere. I don't have to go any farther, because I think I've found the thing I was looking for. Here, in the Valley of the Shadow. What, Alan? What have you found? I can't say what it is, but... Because I, I don't quite know yet. All right, Duke. 
We needn't wait any longer. What I'd rather... What is it, Ruby? Somebody's coming in. Speak around the side door. Hey, Pop, I gotta use your phone. I gotta... It's the sheriff, Duke. What do you want to use the phone for, Sheriff? Duke Mantee. Yeah. Get his guns, Jackie. All right, come on, talk. Are you alone? I said, are you alone? We've been trailing you, Duke, and by heavens, we've caught you. Ruby, get in here quick. What made you think I'd be around here? Because they caught your pals. Two men and a blonde, right? Where was it? Come on, tell me or I'll tear a hole in you a yard wide. Caught him in Buckhorn. Where's that? New Mexico, Duke, about uh, 90 miles southeast. When? When? We heard about it a few minutes ago. The blonde tipped him off about this place. She squealed. The dang squeal. I couldn't figure it out about you being here, but I guess it's the truth, all right. Hey, Duke, what are you waiting for? Come on, let's lay him up before... Shut up! Dead. Shut up! Give me time to think. Duke, no, don't waste time thinking. That isn't your game. You've got to keep going and going and going. Yeah, token fast. Next thing you know, you'll be laid out flat in a marble slab. Where'd they take her? I don't know. Albuquerque, maybe. If we head for there, they'll take us. You want your revenge, don't you, Duke? You want to go out of your way again to get that blonde who told them you were here. Well, don't you do it, Duke. Even if she did betray you, don't you commit a worse crime. Don't betray yourself. Go on. Run for the border and take your illusions with you. Of course. Of course, I think I hear a car coming. You're obsolete, Duke. You're like me. You've got to die. Then die for freedom. That's worth it. Don't give up your life for anything as cheap as revenge. All right, pal. I'm going. Now, listen, folks. We've had a pleasant evening here, and I'd hate to spoil it with any killing at the finish. So stay where you are till we're out of sight, because we'll be watching. Better cut the phone wires, Jackie. Pack up the shells, Bugs. Right. You won't get far, Duke. I've got 20 men coming here to meet me. That's one of their cars he just heard. Hey, Duke, wait a minute. You're not forgetting me. Car stopped on the road. The guy with a rifle. Cops? Looks like it. Hicks or G's? Hicks, lay low. Jackie, put out the light. Might as well give up, man. See, you haven't got a chance. Get behind that counter. All of you. Got one of them, Duke. Get away from that window. Get behind the counter and keep this mob in here covered. See anything, Jackie? Only uh, six or seven. Uh, nothing to worry about. They're trying to work around toward our car. Yeah, I can see them now. Get out the kitchen door. When enough of them get across the road, give them a couple of bursts to scare them. Then snap back here. And watch yourself, kid. Okay, too. I'll cover you now. The United States of America versus Duke Mantee. <laughs> it's an inspiring moment, isn't it, Gabrielle? <laughs> Sign. Them deputies probably all drunk. Gabriel, where are you? Here, on the floor. Ah, so dark. Alan. Alan, when you get to France, what do you see first? Uh, customs officers. But what's the first real sight you see? Oh, the fields and forests of Normandy, and then. What, Alan? And then Paris. Duke, they're crossing the road. Why doesn't Jackie open up? Hey, where you are. He'll get them. Paris is the most wonderful place in the world to be in love, isn't it? All places are marvelous. Even here. Especially here, my darling. Next thing we know, those gas pumps will go up in flames. As long as I live, I'll be grateful to the Duke. Alan, will you please kiss me? Okay, Bugs. Ruby, come on. We're pulling out. Ruby. It's going to be all over now, Gabrielle. Not for us, Alan. Never. Jack has got killed, Duke. I just seen him. Yeah, we'll have to leave him. Okay, Mr. Chisholm, you and your wife and the sheriff. You're coming with us. Uh, uh, me too, Duke? No, not you, Pop. Come on, on your feet. Just go through that door with your hands up. You won't, none of you get hurt if you keep your hands up and make plenty of noise. Open the door, Ruby. The rest of you stay where you are for a while. Good night, folks. Hey, Duke. Ellen, keep down. Duke. Get out of my way, pal. Don't let me down now. You mean you still want it? It's no matter whether I want it or not. You've got to do it. Okay, pal. I'll be seeing you soon. Ellen! Ellen! He meant it. He really meant it. I think he's coming too, Gabby. Alan. Alan, look at me. It doesn't hurt. Or at least it doesn't seem... Oh, it's all right, darling. As soon as we can, we'll get a doctor. Uh, Gabby, I... Oh, Grant, what can we do? Somebody help me. Please, please. It's too late, darling. Too late. They were right, Gabrielle. I mean, the star. <laughs> I... I had to come all this way to find the reason... Duke understood what it was I wanted. I hope you'll be... I hope... 
I'm really not. What have I done? What did you say? Oh. Uh, no. No, don't worry, Alan. I'm not going to be a crybaby about it. I know you died happy. Didn't you, Alan? Didn't you? Gabby, you all right, Gabby? Yeah, I'm all right. And him, Squire. He's dead. You should have known, Bose. Man, he'd never miss twice. Gosh, that's kind of tough. He was a good guy at that. Oh, they got man T, Gabby, and that fellow Ruby a couple of hundred yards down the road. They were full of holes. Gabby? What, Ben? Listen, Gabby. Now, here's the funny thing. Mr. Squire, uh, his life insurance policy, $5,000. He made it out to you. Said he wanted you to spend it on a trip to France. Darndest fella I ever did see. Yeah, me too. What happened to them society people? Oh, they're okay. Which reminds me, Mr. Chisholm was kind of worried about his car. I'd better look her over. Gabby? Gabby, I guess you'll be leaving here now. Yes, Grant. Maybe it's all for the best. He wanted me to. Gramp. Yes? We'll bury him out there in the petrified forest. He... He wanted that, too. Yes. That's what he said, didn't he? Yes, sir. Turn this teller I ever did see. Thus in your field, my seed of harvestry will thrive. For the fruit is like me that I set. God bids me tend it with good husbandry. This is the end for which we train on it. Our stars will be back with our curtain calls in just a minute. You know, after the war, we're going to see some outstanding developments in television. Some of these days, people all over the country may be saying... Why, I remember when you just heard things and couldn't see them. Boy, when that time comes, Mr. Kennedy, my job will be a lot easier when I tell women how Lux Care keeps Slip the Nighties looking pretty. They'll be able to see what I mean. First, I'll hold up an old-looking rayon slip and say, Ladies, look at what strong soap, hot water, and rough handling did to this lovely slip. See how frayed the shoulder straps are. And the seam, it's pulled apart. Notice how faded the color is, too. Color, Sally? Will we have television in Technicolor, too? <laughs> They're working on it. Then after I show that old-looking slip, I'll bring out another and say, And now, ladies, here's the same kind of slip as the first, but this one was washed with lukewarm water and gentle Lux flakes. Compare the color. See how bright and fresh this second one looks. And see this strap, firm as new. This slip has been luxed 30 times, yet it still looks lovely. You can see for yourself. How Lux Care keeps pretty undies new looking longer. Actually, three times longer, the records show. No, you can't see all that through your radio yet, ladies. But you can prove it for yourself. Actual washing tests show Lux Care keeps undies lovely three times longer. So don't risk harsh wash day methods. Keep your undies lovely longer the Lux way. Thomas Mitchell brings our stars back for their curtain call. Ronald Coleman and Susan Hayward come to the footlights to receive our thanks for bringing the petrified forest back to life in a very moving and convincing manner. And thanks, may I add, to the fine work of a magnificent cast. Well, Tommy, I'm convinced of one thing tonight, that Susan Hayward is a really splendid actress. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Coming from you, that is a lovely compliment. You know, uh, Ronnie, Susan has just produced a double feature. A double feature? Mm-hmm. Twin boys. Twins, eh? Well, both of them? Mm -hmm. Both redheads, too. <laughs> well, congratulations, Susan. That's quite an achievement for a screen star. Do they make much noise, Susan? <laughs> Do they? Each one yells so loud you can't hear the other. <laughs> oh, they're probably, probably arguing about who gets top billing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should know about such things, Ronnie. You have a new little girl of your own. New? Well, she's nine months and runs the entire household. <laughs> oh, I understand, Ronnie, you're back from a tour of the Army and Navy hospitals. 
How did you find the spirit of the boys? Oh, my dear fellow, a lesson to all of us. In two weeks, I talked to about 7,000 of them, Tommy. First, of course, they were happy beyond all belief to be home. And then their next thought was of anything or anybody but themselves. And they wished us good luck as we left. They wished you luck. <laughs> well, that's a pretty wonderful spirit. Thanks for the good report, Ronnie. And coming back to this stage, I'd like to tell you what we've set for next week. Our play is the deeply moving drama Moontide, from John O'Hara's screen hit, filmed by 20th Century Fox. And as the roving dock worker we, who saves the life of his future bride, we have the formidable Humphrey Bogart in one of his rare and most unusual radio appearances. Co-starred with Mr. Bogart is the ever-appealing Virginia Bruce as the girl who fights death and danger for the man she loves. It's a fine play and a great cast, Tommy. Good night. Good night. Good night and all our thanks. <laughs> our sponsors, the makers of Luck Flakes, join me in wishing you to be here with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Humphrey Bogart and Virginia Bruce in Moontide. This is Thomas Mitchell saying good night from Hollywood. Today, in war-devastated countries, 125 million men, women, and children are in dire need of clothing. In many cases, the need for clothing is greater than the need for food. The United National Clothing Collection, the only drive of its kind this spring, is asking every American family to help fill this need, help prevent misery and death among these suffering millions overseas. Search your home from cellar to attic, through closets and trunks, for every bit of clothing you can spare. Take it to your nearest collection depot this week. You can get the address from your local newspaper or radio station. Thomas Mitchell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, who are celebrating their 30th anniversary. He can soon be seen in Captain Eddie. Heard in tonight's cast were Norman Field, Bill Martell, Leo Cleary, Ed Emerson, Eddie Marr, Charles Seal, Regina Wallace, Jay Novello, and Herbert Rawlinson. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Moon Tide with Humphrey Bogart and Virginia Bruce. It's spry for cake, spry for pie, spry for all you bake and fry. Depend on spry for feather light cakes, tender flaky pastry, golden digestible fried foods for all your cooking. Remember the word for pure, all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. S-P-R-Y, spry. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Moon.